Greetings from Istanbul. My name is Mehmet Özdoğan. I'm an archaeologist and I would like to welcome to you to a new installment of Tiny Lecture Series organized by Archaeology Now. My main field of work is on the Neolithic period and my, I have been work trying to understand where, when and how it began and how it dispersed other parts of the world. It was three years ago I was, again, I was invited to Houston to speak on the new uh, recent findings of uh, uh, Neolithic and in, in southeastern Turkey, mainly derived by the interest developed on the enigmatic side of Quebec Tepe. So now we call this culture the Quebec Tepe culture, this Neolithic culture, but it's not only that side, it, it is dispersed into a very large area in the upper Euphrates and upper Tigris basins. So I will try to make a very brief summary of what we know of that period. However, I think we should first put Quebec Tepe into a time scale. Uh, it is quite early, much earlier than anything of the monumental architecture. So it's not, it is, that's why it's quite interesting. Of course, we are in the Neolithic period. In our conventional understanding of Neolithic period is that, was when I was a student actually, or some de de until some decades ago, it was a time when people started cultivating cereals, legumes and lentils. They started domesticating animals, they developed new technologies, uh, they started living in permanent houses, they developed villages, and eventually they invented pottery. So with the pottery, they started uh, a new way of food pre pre preparing food, uh, storing food, serving food, and fermentation. So now we know, know, we can, we now, uh, know that the Neolithic period was not an instantaneous event. It, took, it spread into a very large time scale. There was a pottery Neolithic, and there was a 3,000 year preceding the pottery Neolithic without pre pottery, which we call PPN. And the earlier phases of it, uh, the pre pottery Neolithic, pre pottery Neolithic A and B, are much more fascinating. That's the time of the Gebek Tepe culture. And what is most, uh, more, most challenging of this period is that uh, even at that, in the earlier stage, even when they had established large settlements, they were still hunter-gatherers. So they must have been living in a very rich environment so, so that they were able to establish numerous big settlements still by hunting and gathering. They became full far, but of course they were experimenting with uh, wild seal, which are in their region with wild animals. So eventually, so they were not trying to become farmers, but they became farmers. They became farmers during the end of the pre pottery Neolithic period. But once they became real farmers, when they had the herds, the system collapsed, and the farmers were dispersed, migrated to other regions, bringing with them the seeds and, uh, and animals. So it became a global system. And more or less, we know the core area of Neolithic covers from southern Levant to central Anatolia. It's a quite an extensive area with different uh, socio-economic models, but they knew each other, they shared information, so it's a completely different world, they had no stress. But the uh, Gebek Tepe culture is restricted to southeast Anatolia, north in Syria and Iraq, when there have been numerous excavations. Uh, now there's more than 28 with, uh, excavations of this uh, site, so we know it in quite detail, and also from service surveys, there's a lot of uh, sites, uh, about more than 100 sites of this culture. And thanks to the uh, large-scale excavations, we can now also see the social stratification, social systems of these sites. So we are not only looking at uh, what they are eating, but how they also how they were living. So it really is a time of new way of living. One of the most challenging aspects of this culture is that they were innovative. Most traditional cultures are very conservative. They resist change, but the Gebek Tepe culture is very dynamic, it's uh, very open to the innovations, so they were experimenting with architecture, so a uh, house be became a house, and the house became a home, and the architecture developed. And they also developed uh, what be special buildings, not houses, they became temples. In, in the earlier years we thought temples started much, much, much later, but we now know that they had special buildings, and we know a lot of them, not only from Gebek Tepe, and they had monumental standing stones. And also they had a special symbolism, which our main idea of Neolithic uh, symbolism was a female mother goddess, but we now know that there's a male de deity uh, in the temples and the phallic symbolism, and also they had a kind of a shamanistic uh, understanding of nature, so they were depicting the pictures of 
all sorts of living creatures, in, not only animals, but also insects, birds, everything which is living, not only eatable things. So it's a kind of a natural symbolism. And also, which we were quite surprised to see that there was a kind of a social stratification. Uh, it's very clear from the burials. There are some burials with adorned with very rich uh, <coughs> uh, ornaments. There are some with almost nothing. So the, clearly, there is a social layering of the society. We don't know who's uh, heading of it. Who was uh, what are the heading the top group who are there? Whether they are cler uh, clergies or some families, but it's very clear that there's an elitist, elitist their elite uh, group controlling the settlement and they are as a power. And they had elite tastes, so there must have been a competition amongst elites. Who has the best craftsmen? It's not only the uh, quality of craftsmen, it's also the taste and artistic taste. So the, within the whole region, you can see that very it's a peaceful period, and they were probably the main asset of that period was sharing the knowledge and competition. So they had talented artisans, but they had taste, and they were really innovative. So all of these figures, which are coming out from Quebec Tepe sites, from several sites within this whole area, are very very innovative. They are all unique. Well. Uh, during the last three years, excavations have continued, and especially now in the Gebek Tepe, uh, which is now being site is ma being managed due to World Heritage System, and uh, there's a new sh shelter and uh, visitor centers. But for that, they needed a lot of rescue excavation uh, for the foundations, and now a lot of. Uh, domestic building of the earliest phase, but round buildings came out. We already knew the presence of them, but now we can speak about a much larger settlement than we knew, and much more better documented now uh, the site. Even the temples now, we have detailed documentation. So uh, we, we, as a picture of Gebek Tepe, the site also is changing dramatically. But also, uh, <clears throat> as they excavate more of this sounding, in every sounding, there are new uh, standing stones, new depictions. And uh, during the last three years, also there have been uh, new excavations. One of the most fascinating one is uh, Bonjuklu Tarla, in the eastern part of the region, about 200 kilometers east of Quebec Tepe in the Tigris Basin. But it also starts with round buildings, PPNA, several houses, enormous big site, and it develops also in the rectangular phase with uh, cult buildings. So there's one with the standing stones, which is like the Quebec Tepe, but only the stones are smaller, but the same mentality. In my lecture many, many years ago I had, uh, in Houston, I had uh, presented a lot of uh, prestige objects of this pre neolithic culture. They were all very uh, uh, unique objects, but then as, the, as, we excavate more, as more excavations continue, their number is increasing. And some of the most fascinating ones are these uh, stone, inlay, uh, stone plaques with stone inlays. You should consider that we are still in the pre neolithic period, all the tools they have is either flint or obsidian, but they could really in, make an inlay of pebbles and uh, innovative things. And this bead, uh, I think, is a, uh, is, a is a kind of fantasy. It's a pebble insert, uh, inlaid with pebbles from other regions and made it into a bead. It's, I think, it's quite difficult. Other prestige objects, a number of prestige objects, and the typolo their typology is also increasing. Every site is producing new ones. And like this uh, snake, for example, uh, with a smiling snake from Hassan Kefuyuk is just a fantasy, I think, quite unique. Uh, to make this long story short, I think the most important thing about the Neolithic of this region is that innovation, sharing of knowledge. They are uh, trying, they are competing with each other, they are developing new things, and the moment they develop, it spreads out very peacefully. Nobody is monopolizing the culture. They are really sharing, so the main asset must be the knowledge and the artist. Who has the best craftsman? Who has the best uh, building? Who has the best architect? So it's really they were you know, developing. But when the system collapsed, of course, uh, when the system collapsed, uh, farmers, most of the farmers left, but the system remained in the region, and later it gave birth to, uh, to more complex societies, to surplus uh, economies, to the development of uh, emergence of uh, towns, 
states, kingdoms, empires, and the modalities of, uh, of living until the Industrial Revolution. So the Neolithic period is a very innovative period, very important period for understanding what was happening in the past. And uh, with every new excavation, we are getting more and more challenged. And I think, it's a, I think there's a lot we have to learn and our way of looking at Neolithic is steadily changing. Well, I must be very thankful for your patience and having this opportunity to talk with you again.